And I'm going back to the beginning of chapter 6 because there's, there, there's much more than my confused little brain could communicate uh, on, a, on, on a Sunday morning. And I, I want to go back and I, and I want to just point out a few things about this morning because uh, the first thing in chapter 6, the, the seriousness of sin. Because I think we have a tendency to trivialize it in our lives. I think we have a tendency to, uh, to assume, like in economics, that there's an intersect between demand and supply, and that's the market value, that we assume that we nestle into some kind of apathetic, complacent place in the Lord in our Christianity where, you know, convenience or opportunity intersects with you know, a ministry availability, and that's where we live, and, and oh, and this is it, you know. Uh, you could go around, hey, are you really living your life surrendered? Well, no, but I mean, I, I don't do, you know, I'm not bad, but I'm not, I'm not really sold out for the Lord, and we find that little discounted market value where we really shouldn't be, where God really didn't intend for us to land. And I'll say it's difficult for those in prosperity because we're not forced by selfish reasons and motives to, to go after the Lord. Now, I will say that there's something extraordinary about the person who can live in prosperity yet chooses to suffer affliction in ministry with the Lord like Moses. That was the thing that was praised about his faith. Y'all remember Moses, although what he was called the Pharaoh's son, you know, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and, but rather he chose to suffer affliction with the Lord's people rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. But I want to go back, and, and because it just lays it out in so many different ways in chapter 6, the seriousness of sin in the life of a believer, and, you know, that first characteristic being dominance. The... The thing that Jesus expressed to us, and the thing that I love, I, I love children's church. In fact, I, you know, I, I sometimes am tempted to do children's church even without children because it gives to us. I remember I, we used to do this every Sunday you know, where I pastored before, and we'd have little rascals in there, and I would bring some kind of illustration. And, and one of those things was a yoke, a leather yoke that goes around the head you know, of an oxen or a cow or a, or a mule or something, you know, a mule, a mule, you put a different harness on them, but a yoke. And, you know, you bring them in and it's, you know, it, you all know what a yoke looks like. It's round, it goes over the head. And, and I ask the kids, you know, well, well, how do they wear this all around the head? And, well, how many of these can he wear for different jobs at one time? Can he put, put one on and, and pull a plow with it here? And can he put another yoke on and pull a cart with it at the same time? No. You can only fit one yoke of work. on there. And Jesus said, listen, take my yoke upon you. He said, you can't serve two masters. You'll love one, you'll hate the other. And somewhere in there, we start to believe that we can find some middle ground to compromise you know, to, to, to justify it, but the dominance that is there. And, and it says it here in, in verse 11. It gives you, gives you verse 11 and 12. He said, Even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. He said, Therefore do not let sin reign. Reign. As dominance. To reign. To rule in your life. And we stop and we think that, that there's some, some kind of little consistent relationship of of sin in our life and it's there and and it's not necessarily destructive but yes it is sin doesn't want to have a part it wants to have the whole it wants to rule it wants to reign and if one little opportunity one little you know place is given there the devil will use that against you to compromise so there's the dominance that happens with sin there's a detachment that happens with sin. Down in verse 16, he said, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? Here's the other big problem with tolerated sin in our life. That when we 
recognize it, and oftentimes we even see it coming, and we know the habit of it, and we can even assume that, oh, I'll probably sin like that again this week, that there is a detachment from the one who you are supposed to be obeying to the one whom you are not supposed to be obeying. There's, so in the dominance that sin has in our life, there's a detachment. As much as we'd like to believe that, that we're kind of okay Christians with tolerated sin in our life, the truth is, is that we're not kind of okay Christians, we're rebellious Christians. And not only that, but in that intentional act, there's a detachment from God. There's an unfilling of His Spirit. It's impossible to consciously sin, plan sin, ignore sin, to do any of those things, and to be filled with the Spirit of God. They just don't do that. We can quench the Spirit of God, we can grieve the Spirit of God, or we can be filled with the Spirit of God or empowered by the Spirit of God. So sin, even in chapter 6 here, listen, there's a dominance that it, that it wants to reign in our lives. It doesn't want to participate. I mean, so often we think it wants to participate. Oh, you know, it's going to come in and it's, you know, it, it's, you know, a little part here. No, it's, it wants to come in and it wants to dominate and it wants to detach, causes separation between you and God. Not only that, but in sin there's also destruction, if you want to know how, look at your relationships. Look at your body, your physical health. Look at your mental health. Evaluate yourself that way. You'll see that there is a destruction in sin. Down there in verse 19, you know, I said, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. He said, just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness... He said, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness. But he said there in what we were doing in sin, he said, presenting your members to impurity and lawlessness. And I can tell you what comes out of impurity and lawlessness. Go to a few places in Africa that really characterizes it. Go to a few places in, go to Las Vegas, right? Go to Detroit. Go to some of these cities where, where we really see lawlessness where they've made laws that police cannot actively pursue a criminal running away. Lawless, what happens? Go look at those countries. Destruction. Uh, you see just ghetto after slum, after ghetto, after broken this, after banged up that, after abandoned car, after car sitting on blocks, after, and, and if not material goods, people. Murder after murder after assault after rape and destruction is what it causes. And not only lawlessness, but he said also impurity. That impurity causes destruction. If you're not sure about that, think about venereal disease. You know, the amazing thing is that uh, the Bible has a cure for all venereal disease. It's called monogamy. And you would think, since we're such great people in the 21st century, that, you know, we surely we would just do good. And hey, since, since you know, venereal disease is, is transmitted by sex and sexual contact of some sort, why don't we just save the human race and quit having promiscuous sex? Even the liberals ought to agree that that's a good idea, but they're the last ones that would do it. They sell the lie of free sex. But sin, what is sin? Sin is impurity and it's lawlessness and where those things are, destruction is. I mean, hurt, damage is done. Not only that, but there's also depression. He said in verse 20, he says, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard uh, to righteousness. If you go back to the 51st Psalm, you remember what, what David did not have in the 51st Psalm? He had a broken heart. He had a broken heart, he had a contrite spirit, he had words of repentance, but he had no joy. He said, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. He wanted him to heal those bones that have been broken. And, and there was no, nothing there. And when you're free from righteousness, listen, you, you're, you can very well find yourself in a state of depression. Not only that. There's destitution in sin. Verse 21, 
He asked, therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things which you were ashamed? And my question is, is what benefit? What benefit? You know, the benefits we get from sin are all false. In pride, you get a sense of false worth. You know, in, in lustfulness, you get a false pleasure. We call it, a, it's called a false pleasure. Because you think it's pleasurous, but it's really just a trick to your mind <laughs> that you're receiving something that's joyful and something is wonderful. And as soon as the sin is passed and gone, well, then the, the feeling of emptiness and destitution is worse than when it began. And so people and go and commit the sin again. And what benefit, right? What profit? You know, but no, sin has no profit. It has no benefit. The wages of sin is death. And, and in it are destitution. Not only that, but there's also disgrace. I don't know, you know, if there's really any truthfully proud parents that destroyed their marriage and left their kids in the, in the situation that they did. I don't know anybody that ever destroyed their, their body or mind with drugs and, and are proud about that. Because he asks, what benefit were you, know, were you deriving from the things which you are now ashamed? Ashamed of. I, I think of a brother in Christ, and really I believe a brother in Christ who was a um, financial manager. I, I know very little about that. <laughs> I, I know how to spend money. I really don't know how to manage it well. you know. Or, but uh, he was a financial manager. He was an investor for people, and, and he cheated, and he did a few things, and that brother in Christ is in prison now. And think, oh, and he has a wife, and he has kids, and, and he's a brother in Christ. Why? Because he, well, you know, it was some white-collar crime. Didn't necessarily hurt anybody, but, man, it ended in disgrace. And right now, it's sitting in his prison cell. Maybe he's at church on Sunday morning, and to read this verse, and to go back, and he said, what, really, what benefit did you have from those things which you are now ashamed he says, you see, you see the consequences of, of sin, that it, there's dominance of sin in your life. There's detachment from the Lord. There's destruction that it brings. Please tell me of the, of the divorce that occurred that didn't involve sin. Right? I've, never, I've never gotten myself into marital counseling where sin wasn't involved. Well, you know, you know Pastor, we're sin-free, but we have these marital problems. Nope. Doesn't exist destruction somebody at odds with their child or their grandchild or their sister or somebody in some close relative and and, there, and there's there's a loss of relationship there and you know what what happened well there's there's no such thing as you know as a, as a sin-free conflict in those situations but you know destitution as well disgrace and then ultimately death because you know even as a christian if if you live in sin well listen I can tell you by the authority of how God keeps his covenants, listen, sinning won't cause you to lose your salvation, but it'll sure cause you not to live. You'll be like a miserable, dead person walking around, and you really won't have a life at all. You know that phrase, right? Hey, go get a life. Get a life, right? And in the Christian terms, you know what that means? Hey, live to, learn to live victoriously in Christ. But I say all of that, to, to give us an idea of the seriousness of what it is. Because I, I don't think until we really appropriate the seriousness of sin in our lives do we really get serious about the resolution. And the resolution of sin is what is everything about what Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8 are all about. If you want to know what they're about, they're about God causing you to be liberated of sin and to live in victory and walk in a victorious life in Him. And so having, having said that, I want to go back and I want to look at the beginning, look through Romans chapter 6 all together. And uh, back there, chapter 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? Well, first of all, it's very clear. We can, we can have a very clear statement in our lives that we have to tell ourselves and I have to tell myself, listen, it's never God's intention for you to sin. How often do you say, God, what is your will? I want to know, I want to know your will. God, show me your will for my life. Well, I can promise you one thing. It's not to sin. That's for sure. We got that down. He said, shall we sin that grace uh, may... Uh, 
continue, I mean, sorry, are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. He said, how shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? He said, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him. Now, there's a, a change in Romans from Romans chapter 5 to Romans chapter 6. And it goes from substitution to identification. If you go back to Romans chapter 5, I think it's verse 6. Listen, it says, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for us. That's a different preposition there, isn't it? I'm, I'm honing in on the, on the preposition. I relate that Christ died for the ungodly. In verse 8, but God, 5, 8, that is, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, in, Rome, in chapter 6, we have different prepositions for ourselves in regards to Christ. It's with him. Verse 4, we have been buried with him. You know, later it says that we too might walk in the newness of life. Verse 5, if we have become united with him. You see, and it goes from the thing that we need to learn, the thing that we need to understand, and, and this is my first point this morning, is we need a realization. We, we need to learn something, and I include myself in it because I haven't figured this out. I don't have this down. I know that this is the thing. In fact, God really squished me the other day driving through Cleburne, and I was driving north on Main Street, you know, and, and, and like the Holy Spirit whispered in my ear, Jeff, if you'd really give yourself wholly unto the Lord, he might do something with you. <laughs> and then just then I, I was pulling up to a light and I could hear amplified speaking going on. I thought, well, maybe they have an event down at the church. I mean, down at the square. Maybe there's a public event. They have a lot of things that they do in Cleburne. And oh, there's a public event. And I got closer. I was like, no, that sounds like preaching. It's like somebody open air preaching, you know. And, and I got up pulling up to the light at the town square and stopped a few cars back. And I could hear it. And I rolled down the window. And this guy's just laying out the gospel message. You know, if you die without Christ, if you die without the redemption that he has offered in his free gift. And, and, I, and I tell you what, God just overwhelmed me with tears and joy and excitement and, and some kind of filling and I thought, well, whatever, you can talk about your Sunday school, your church programs, whatever. these guys are doing it. <laughs> Those guys are doing it, right? And, and, I, and, I, and I heard that, and I just, I would just thought, wow, you know? Wow, you know? And if I would give myself wholly unto God and things that we need to learn, the realization that we need to know, and, you know, if you go back, look, Look in verse chapter, I'm sorry, verse 3. Chapter 6, verse 3. He said, or do you not know? Don't you know? Do you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified. Knowing, knowing this, realizing this, learning this, that our old self was crucified with him. And if we know this, and if we learn this, and if we have it down, if you're starting to think, well, yeah, uh, Pastor Jeff, I got this, then are you walking a victorious life in Christ Jesus, you know, living out the Spirit-empowered ministry in your life? That, you know, that's a pretty brave... You, you, better, you better really be confident about that, or do we need to learn? Do we need to know? Verse 9, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead is never to die again. And these, I'm telling you, these are the instructions that God has given us in living a victorious life. We need to learn it. We need to understand it. And understanding what? Well, first of all, what, what is the doctrine of substitution? What was chapter 5 all about? That he died as a substitutionary offering for us in our place on that cross that he was the Lamb of God, that he was the scapegoat, that on him were put all the sins of the world, that he was in our place, that we were Barabbas, right, that stepped out into freedom, that he was the sinless Son of God that stepped into persecution and condemnation and, and penalty, right? And we got, okay, we got the substitution down, right. Honestly, that's where American Christianity really stops. Christ died on the cross for me. Oh yeah, my substitutionary death. I'm good in Christ. 
My sins have been paid in full. But listen, the next thing, and the, you know, the first thing on the road to living a different life in Christ is knowing the doctrine of identification. That's what changes coming into chapter 6. We know the doctrine of substitution. Yes, he died in our place. Chapter 6, identification, that now we're with him, we're in him. And there's a different thing going on in understanding really what happened that in Christ, in his substitutionary death, and as he hung on the cross, listen, that on him were put all the sins of the world, and even we hung with him in, so, in such a way to speak spiritually. And then chapter 6 describes it, that in his grave, as he was buried, right, in the illustration of baptism, that we are buried with him. That that old self is being, you know, immersed into that liquid grave. And the new self, that with him in his resurrection, that we're raised to walk in the newness of life. And substitution, what is the, the doctrine of substitution removes the penalty of sin from us, but the doctrine of, of identification places the responsibility of ministry unto God on us. And the life that I now live, the way he put it in Galatians chapter, I think it's chapter 2, verse 20, he said, nevertheless, you know, uh, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. And how did he put it? But the life I now live, I live. You know the rest of it, brother? Yeah? <laughs> yeah? You know, according to the Son of God who died, he gave himself for me, that, that in, a, in our resurrection we have a new identification, a new master, a new power a new ability that, that's been given unto us that we don't necessarily realize or we haven't learned and we haven't understood really what is going on. But in chapter 6, well, there's, there's identification, realizing, learning, knowing that there is that accountability there and there's that identification and we're supposed to be identified with him. And now listen, it's not automatic, is it? I really don't know anybody that was ever saved and just automatically went on to live their life. You all know this, even in the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And you, if it was automatic, you would have just stopped there. That's good. Go make disciples of all nations. No, it's, it's not automatic, is it? Go and make disciples of all nations. And he said, what? Teaching them whatsoever things I've commanded you. And then not only that, but he, he commanded the identification, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That he wants us to identify with him in following in believer's baptism. Listen, if, if anybody here has never followed in believer's baptism, stop and think about that this morning. And what that is, is that after you have come to know saving faith in Christ Jesus, after you have receive the free gift of salvation then you are to follow in believers baptism which is baptism by immersion in water and it's not an option it was a mandate to complete right from the lord and that's a big hang-up in your spiritual walk for anybody who has not followed in believers baptism that that's something that you need to do and and it's a it's a physical illustration of our identification with christ but what did he say? He said, go and make disciples, and not only that, but teaching them, because it's not automatic. And as we read further down here, what he said, verse 6, he said, what knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. He said, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death is no longer master over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11, even so consider yourselves. Uh, the King James and New King James is, is reckon yourself. Uh, it, it's a good Greek word. It's where we get our word a log from. A log or as a le ledger. Legizomai. Oh, you know, are you, hey, you keeping track of expenses? Yes, I have a log of them. You know, I, I have a log of it. I have a, a documentation, an appropriation of it. And he said, you know, what, what, what are we supposed to do? He said, well, this is the next step. First of all, you realize, you know, God never wants you to continue in sin. We know, we learn that he wants us to identify with him, not only in his death, for the forgiveness of sins, 
Y'all remember the song? Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sin far away, rising he justified, right? And we're justified through Christ. You know, someday he's coming, a oh, glorious day, you know, to finish the song. <laughs> we, we get the rest of it. But knowing that stuff, learning that stuff, we get to verse 11, and he says, even so consider yourselves. That's a, that's a verb unto us. A verb for us to, to reckon ourselves, to legizomai. Well, what is that? It's really, as far as they can tell in ancient Greek, it's, a, it's an accounting term. To appropriate. Right? To consider, to com- appropriate, and, and say, well, oh, wow, my paycheck is, you know, my paycheck is going to be whatever, you know, $1,200 this week, but hey, it's all reckoned unto bills. <laughs> it's all considered for bills, you know, it's all, it's all a good my unto bills. It's appropriated under that. So listen, there's a realization, there's an appropriation, you know, that even so appropriate yourselves or consider yourselves. You know, how, how do you go? What are you dedicated unto? Well, you're dead unto sin. I like the illustration that uh, Matt gave after church last Sunday. He said, you know, uh, what does a dead body do? <laughs> you know, so, and, and what if a dead body is there and, and sin comes up to it and says, hey, you know, it's dead unto sin. It's unresponsive unto sin. It's unreactive unto sin. The, you know, it's, it's no longer available unto sin. It's just turned off to sin. And it's not even, you know, appropriated for that anymore. And so there's an appropriation that needs to, to con- happen. But he said to, to consider yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Uh, the appropriation, and then there has to be a cooperation. And this, this is the difficult part. That even before Christ, listen, we have a free will. Christ never forced himself uh, on people. And I can't ever find any examples where, you know, that he was forced on somebody. Perhaps John the Baptist from the womb, if you want to think of that. You know, some kind of you know, a place where he didn't have an opportunity. But he said, what, number one, to to consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ. Verse 12, he said, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. And so you leave no place for it. As I mentioned last, you know, don't let it reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey its lust. And verse 13, and don't go on presenting. He says, don't leave a place for it and don't make an appropriation for it. I, love, I like that the scripture puts it elsewhere. He says, make no provision for the flesh. You know, don't even put it there. May, you know, start preventing, start avoiding. Do whatever you have to do. Don't go on presenting your members uh, of your body as, uh, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but to present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. He said, for sin shall not be master over you, for you're not under the law, but you're under grace. And uh, so that there's a realization of knowing what the will of God is, knowing what God did in Christ, that he was the substitutionary death, but listen, also he's our identification to go on and to live in him, uh, appropriating your body, and then also cooperating with him. Because he said he gave us the commandment, don't let sin reign. We have the freedom to not sin. An unsafe person doesn't have the freedom to not sin. I like the way Adrian Rogers puts it. He said that, you know, the unsaved man thinks he has freedom. He says, well, I'm free to do what I do. He says, yeah, but the problem is is you're not free to do what you should do. You're only free to do what you want to do, and that is to commit sin. And as an unsaved person, you're not free to do what you should do. It's not a possibility. The power hasn't been granted. The ability had, but for those of us in Christ, it has been granted. It is there. Uh, an interesting thing: Abraham Lincoln, right, signed the uh, uh, Emancipation Proclamation. We know that, right? Back in nineteen, when was it, kids? 1865? Yeah, nineteen. I had the I had the decade right. It was the wrong century. Eighteen sixty-five. Is that right? Eighteen sixty-four. Does anybody know when Emancipation? I don't know. Eighteen sixties. 
And, and he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, and all of a sudden, federally, across the whole nation, by law, all slaves were free. Right? The word had been given. The authority had said so. But you know the amazing thing is that in that moment, not all slaves were free. Some of them didn't even realize it. There was no Fox News and MSNBC and, and uh, uh, what's the other one, Communist News Network, CNN. Uh, you know, um, they, they didn't have those, right? And so, you know, the, the, the tragedy was is that Abraham Lincoln had signed it into law. And they were free by, by rule of the authority, but some of them didn't even realize it. You know, some of them, you know, came to know it and they didn't act upon it. And the truth is, is that some of those who remain, remain slaves remain, you know, even after they came to know of the freedom and the, and the provision that had been made, that they chose not to leave their place of service, you know, if they wanted to do that respectfully, so nothing against them. But in our terms, and the illustration for us, that yes, it is God's desire for us to leave slavery. It is, our, is God's desire for us to cooperate with our own emancipation proclamation. When God set the Jews free from Egypt, it was his intention that they should get everything together, round themselves up, and to get out of Dodge, or Egypt rather, right? And then to go and trusting faith to follow him into a prosperous and victorious life. But listen, we know by example that they didn't necessarily do that. They came out of Egypt, but then they wandered around in the desert. And who do you suppose that illustration is for? I know it's been for me. <laughs> it's been for me at times. That no, I'm, I'm not that person that I was, but am I the person that God intends for me to be? Or did I get stuck in the middle somewhere in unbelief? You know, just because we trust him for salvation doesn't necessarily mean that you're willing to trust him for every victory and every service and every gift and every opportunity and what he really wants to do with your life. Doesn't necessarily mean so. Uh, uh, F.B. Meyer, uh, the old Baptist preacher, pastor, I think he was a contemporary with D.L. Moody back in, let me get the century right, in 18, <laughs> you know, in late 19th century, uh, I'll put it that way, F.B. Meyer, I think he went from like 19, I'm sorry, 1850 to 1930 or something like that, but as a young man, he went to a graduation and a meeting at Cambridge, and he went to this meeting, and, and it involved the sending off of six missionaries to China. And one of those missionaries to China was a young man named C.T. Studd. Uh, C.T. Studd was the outstanding celebrity athlete of England at the time. He was the, the, the star cricket player. He was the, you know... He was whatever, the J.J. Watt or, or whatever it may be, what, what we might attribute to him. And these men and, and F.B. Meyer, God had just pointed out to him something in this man, C.T. Studd, although he had all this sport opportunity, all this celebrityism, and really all this wealth and everything, and how this man with a smile on his face and a joy in his heart was leaving it all behind to go be, and listen, back then, I do, when you were a missionary, you were a missionary. You know, it wasn't even quite like missionary life is today. And he was going to be a missionary in China. And it really convicted F.B. Meyer's heart. What does this man have that I don't? And he asked C.T. Studd, no pun intended in the name, right? And he asked, he asked this man, you know, what is it? What do you have that I don't? And C.T. Studd told him, listen, when you learn to give everything away to God, well, then you'll have that joy and that fulfillment. And so, you know, the Holy Spirit used that to whack F.B. Meyer on the forehead, you know, and and he went home that night to have it out with Jesus in his bedroom. And, and he, he got down on his knees and he said, Lord, I want, I want to give you everything. And he said his, 
in the presence of God came into the room and just an overwhelming experience and and God said well give me your keys right give me the keys to your life and F.B. Meyer said you know in, in his mind and his heart as if he took his key ring and he gave it to the Lord and he sat there in silence and and the Lord counted off the keys and he started to leave the room and he felt the presence of the Holy Spirit leaving the room and he said wait 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 you know hold on hold on what what what, what, what is it the Holy Spirit said, uh, I'm missing a key. And F.B. Meyer in his heart was like, well, it's, it's a little box, you know. It's just a little box in one little compartment of my life. And, you know, and he said the Spirit of God just started to leave. And he said, no, 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 no. Wait. And he, and he gave the last key. Whatever it was in his life that God brought him to that, that altar, right, where we can actually give ourselves unto him. And F.B. Meyer said that that was the beginning of his spirit-filled ministry. That that was the beginning point of what it was. When he came to that point where he learned to cooperate with God in faith. To cooperate with God. God, I'll trust you. I'll trust you with these keys and I'll trust you with every key and I'll trust you with, with everything. And then he knew what it was to have that over that that joy regardless of of whatever it was in the in the fulfillment of the power of the holy spirit in his ministry when he when he began to cooperate with the lord yes lord okay lord and he released those things unto him that's the thing that we have to come to the point of doing he said don't let sin reign and he said don't present your members and how do we do that? Listen, the only way I know to do that in the moment is when you know it's there, when the, either you're planning it now in your mind, and I, probably some of you are even thinking about this week, I know I do such and such and such and such, and I know it'll probably fall on every day or whatever it is, and, you know, tell me, you know, that we don't harbor and plan and know about habitual sin in our lives. And at what point are we willing to cooperate with the Lord? And see, the difficulty is, is that identification with him. Because what did Christ do? He died. And in our identification with him, we die unto ourselves. Oh. And there's sometimes a tear involved. There's, there's sometimes emptiness involved. Y'all remember when, when Paul talking to Felix? I don't know if y'all remember that part when he, talk, he was speaking to Felix and he said that he always you know, intended to serve the Lord, right, diligently. And he said, really, he said he always, you know, the, the Greek word he used is, I vessel for the Lord. We're like, what does that mean? He says, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a container. I'm a conduit. And I empty myself in order that I might be used by the Lord because the Lord's not going to share that container with you. He'll let you keep your personality. He'll let you keep your unique person and who you are and all those things. But spiritually in our lives, He expects us to identify with the death of Christ. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But the life I live now is identified with Christ, and I live with Him. And so the thing that we have to come to in the, in the moment of decision is dying unto yourself and living unto Christ. And I wish I could say that there's some kind of, you know, uh, special thing that did not make it a sacrifice, but it's not true. You'll never have a sacrifice-free, victorious life in Christ. You'll never have a sacrifice-free ministry in Christ. It doesn't exist because he said later in Romans chapter 12, Brethren, I beseech you by the mercy of God to present yourselves a living sacrifice. The sacrifice is, well, sin, Satan, and self, right? When Satan comes along and tempts you, you have to realize that you're identified with Christ. Listen, no, no, Satan, I, I've died with Christ, and a dead man is not subject unto the temptation of sin nor the law. 
and you have no rule or dominion over me, when it comes to sin, right, and the influence of this world, and the, the way of this world, and the way that they would tempt you to act or to behave or to do in those temptations, you know, to refuse that, to turn that away, or when it comes to self, that's the hardest one, I believe. When it comes to self, just maybe wanting something a particular way. It doesn't necessarily mean you want to shoot up heroin, but God, I want my life a certain way. Or God, I'm uncomfortable with a certain thing. Or God, I this. Y'all know where we get the word ego? It's a great, great thing. <laughs> we get the word ego from a Koine Greek word, ego. Guess what ego means in Greek? I. <laughs> it's like, I. But Lord, I. Now, the eyes that he's concerned about, it does say cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. And it does say that, that he's a high priest that cannot, you know, you know, that he's not a high priest that can't be touched with the feelings our infirmity, of our infirmities, right? But in every way was tempted. And the things that he does want to identify with in us and I and me, we can tell him, Lord, I'm tempted. Lord, I'm scared. Lord, I'm empty. Lord, I'm depressed. Lord, I'm hurt. Lord, I'm, I'm all these things. But we can't come to him and say, Lord, I don't want. Or, Lord, I don't like. Lord, I, I don't want to do that. that but to, to be able to let, let go of those keys. And I'll say this. And this is what I tell myself. If I really had this down so good, you know, and if I was really a superstar at it, why isn't my fruit in the Lord a little more notable? Why does he convict me of things like, Jeff, if you really give yourself fully to the Lord, he might do something with you. I think we, we walk about as if, you know, we're almost with the assumption, oh yeah, Romans 6, we do that. We do Romans 6. <laughs> do we? I mean, do we really? Do we really have that life that, that we've died unto ourselves and the life that we live, we live unto Christ Jesus, right, who gave himself for us. I don't know. I don't know that we do, but that's what we need to do. And that's the place he wants us to get to. And I believe because the word of God says it, the reason why I always press forward and, and go forward and I fall forward and I get up and I try again and I repent and I, and I read this again and I study it again and I teach it again is because I believe that, listen, it's not a problem with the spirit of God or the word of God or the system of God, but it's a matter of me learning this and getting it down, and realizing, appropriating myself, cooperating with the Lord, learning to cooperate with Him, and to do these things. And he goes on to what we didn't cover last week. Uh, down here, verse um, 14, he said, you know, sin shall not be master over you. You're not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. He said, may it never be. He said, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you're the slave of the one who you obey, either of sin, resulting in death, or of obedience, resulting in righteousness? He said, but thanks be to God, that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart, that form of teaching to which you were committed, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. It is in the moment, it's easy to do. It's easy to, to see the decision. You, you have a yoke that you can determine to put on every morning. And think about this, you know, literally. And you get up in the morning. When you stand up, you know, I, the other morning I got up and, and, uh, and I said, you know, Lord, y'all have heard that joke. It's been a really great day so far. Gone through the whole day without sinning. And I'm doing really good, but I'm about to get out of bed. You know? <laughs> and you have to determine which yoke to put on. You know why the scripture says, walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, because you can only wear one yoke. You get busy doing what you ought to be doing, and you find that you don't have the ability to do that which you should not. 
You find a, a, a righteous substitution to the things that, that you want to do. You know, one of the problems I have about 7 o'clock every night is I want to eat everything. And I mean everything. You know, maybe I have a Lipton gene problem or something, but, you know, I'm like, well, I've had, you know, uh, you know, three bowls of cereal and 16 cookies, but I still feel hungry. And it's a legitimate feeling. It really is a legitimate feeling. I feel hungry. I'm hungry. I want to eat something else. I'm hungry. You know, and it, well, you know what I can do? I can find something right then in the Lord to invest myself in. Or I can go do that which I shouldn't. You know? For those men who have a hard time controlling their eyes. You know, Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes that I would not look upon a maiden or a virgin. You know, when, when the opportunity is there and that's what you want to do, you know what you do? You find, you find some righteous act in Christ Jesus to do instead because you're not going to do both at the same time. Right? You're not going to look at a woman in a lustful way and serve the Lord. So rather in that moment, why don't you cooperate with God and present your members unto righteousness? You know, so often we just want to do the omission and not the commission. We just want to say, well, I'm not going to look. You ladies, next time you find a, a juicy bit of gossip or something, you know, and something you have to carry on or share or some kind of criticism, I don't mean to pick on y'all, but I tell you what, that's, that's a lady's deal. You ladies will chop each other down, you know, fast. And, you know, that, that's the nature of a, of, a, of a lady. You'll share more. The Bible says busybodies, you know. We know what kind of bad things men are. We know what kind of bad things women can do next time that comes around rather than participating you find some righteous act in the lord jesus christ to do instead because you can't do both right you just can't do both at the same time and so we find that other thing to do we present ourselves to him rather than to sin but i'll tell you what in the middle of that split second process you're gonna die in christ you're gonna die to yourself it's going to be contrary to every bit of flesh and corruption and carnality that you have, you know, and your whole self, you know, ah, you know and, but you see, you know, you know what you are to do in Christ and you cooperate in his system and that's what you do. And he said in 19, he said, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh and I've been using these human terms for our illustration the whole time. So often Paul uses all these illustrations like marriage in Ephesians 5 and 6, like slavery here in Romans chapter 6. He says, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. But listen, it's so important that we realize omission is not enough. That as we're omitting, we're committing. That as we omit sin, that we commit ourselves unto Christ. And if the commission is not there, good luck on the omission will fail, and we'll do it again. Verse 20, he said, uh, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, right? In, in other words, you were void of righteousness. He said, there, there was the old illustration, there was the old picture, that listen, when you were slaves to sin, there was no righteous goodness going on and happening in your life. He said, you know, and, and contrarily the same as, you know, verse 21, he said, you know, for what benefit were you then deriving from the things which you are now ashamed for the outcome of those things is death? He said, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. It's, it's the same way he said, remember when you were void of righteousness and living in that life, that there was no righteousness involved. He said, likewise, if you would cooperate in the will of God, surrender your own life, surrender your own will, present yourselves a living sacrifice. If you would cooperate with the will of God, then there would be righteousness and a, and a void of unrighteousness. Right? It would be, <laughs> it works in the same principle. You can't have both masters. What we like to think is that we can have some kind of balance between the two. 
and we're telling ourselves because we're not living like the dregs of our society that we're victorious Christians. That's not true. So often we're just like compromised Christians. The way he de described it to Laodicea, he says, you're neither hot or cold. He, he did say you weren't cold. I mean, the truth is they weren't cold. They weren't the dregs of you know, society. They weren't necessarily purely like the world. He said, your problem is that you're stuck in the middle. And we're like, well, I'm not completely surrendered to God, but I'm not, I'm not some gross, ungodly sinner. He said, it's one or the other. You know, in which way should it be? And he said, but listen, here's the good news. Here's the good thing, that, that if we cooperate with with God, you know what is promised, just like it's promised in God, that blessed is a man who what, doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the path of sinners, sit in the seat of the scornful, you know, that his delight is in the law of the Lord, in his law he meditates day and night. And you know what he said? And he, and he said, and he shall be like a tree planted. Y'all know the illustration by Christ about the seed? <laughs> Trouble. You know, that, that each of us in Christ Jesus are a precious seed, Right? He said, but it, you know what happened has to happen to that seed? A seed has to die to be anything. A seed, seeds don't produce fruit. Right? Seeds don't. You're like, well, I got a seed. Well, what do you, hey, why kill that sucker in order that you know, it might live? So the seed dies in order to become a plant. In Psalm 1, it says that he will be like a tree planted, right? That's the one thing so many of us need in the beginning of our planting, according to Christ, is to die to ourselves as a seed. So, I mean, we really think that the things that we have are something, or maybe us and ourselves and our own will is something. But do you ever wonder what God might grow out of you if you, were, if you could become willing to die to yourself? I mean, that's what, that's what entices me. Lord, if I was like Moses, or Enoch, or Gideon, Willing really to present myself a little. If I was willing to die, what kind of tree planted by rivers of water would you make out of me? Because the thing that goes with that, he said, and he'll be like a tree firmly planted by rivers of water, which brings forth his fruit in his season. That there's something in there that God's going to use you to be a blessing. That God wants to bless with you and it says the similar thing here even in verse 20 21 he said well what benefit i want to ask you right now for those of you who know that you have habitual sin in your life and that you commit it that you continue to commit it maybe you've been dealing with it for five years 10 years 20 years however long it is i i want to ask you what benefit you're getting from it because some of us have that we know we have that some of us don't think we have that maybe we're not honest I, you know, that's a question I ask myself. What benefit am I getting? What, what great benefit, even the last two or three years, is there from, from that unrepented sin? Here's the next question, verse 22. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, what you derive a benefit. <laughs> there, there's, there's benefit there when the Lord uses you that he builds in his kingdom with precious stone and precious metals that will endure Right, the judgment of fire, that there's a benefit resulting in sanctification. Not only that, there's a transformation in you and the outcome, eternal life. And, but even much more than that, you know, when we're willing to do those things, when we're willing to be a vessel, y'all remember that illustration. Paul said, I vessel. I like Reagan wrote down an idea for a T-shirt that said, I vessel hard. It has a little scripture next to it. Because the thing is, is that as a vessel, we empty ourselves. You know, and when we, when we empty ourselves, God will take us. And what God takes, He cleanses. What God cleanses, He fills. What God fills, He uses. And I can think of people who were used by God in my life, and I'm really grateful for them. And I look up to them more than anybody else, and, you know, any celebrity, anybody on the face of the world. I, I look up to them. Listen, something in me wants to do likewise. Lord, make me a blessing to somebody. You know, Lord, you know, 
bring me to the point where I will die unto myself in order that I might be planted, in order that your spirit might bring forth that fruit in my life in its season. But listen, it's hard to die into yourself. It's hard to wait on the Lord. It's hard to do those things. And it really requires you wrapping your hands and your mind and your heart around the word of God and believing him. It's worth it to die into yourself. He said the benefit resulting in sanctification because, listen, verse 23, the wages of sin is death and you make it a habit in your life and you'll probably die faster than God intended for you to die doing a lot less than God ever intended for you to do. You know, he's got big plans and ideas, but he likes cooperation. <laughs> and he asked us to present ourselves a living sacrifice unto him. You know, don't wait, and please don't be the kind of person to, to ask for his dictatorship to force his way into your life and to make you do it. Uh, what an unglorifying thing unto God. Y'all, we, we know what's glorifying to God, right? You can see one parent tell their child, Hey, Junior, don't mess with that. Leave it alone. Junior stops what he's doing and he goes back to his parent. And he say, wow, what a great parent, what a great child. And you see another kind of junior, <laughs> you know, uh, junior, you leave that junior, you better put that down. Junior right now, I'm in a junior. And, and the only way junior will respond is if that parent goes over there and, you know, gets junior, jerks him up by the ear. And that's the only thing he knows how to respond to. Don't be that child of God. And you say, what a disgrace. What a bad picture. I, I love the first picture much more. Little Junior, well, he stopped and he returned back to his father, didn't he? You see the second picture. Don't be the second Junior. Well, God will come straighten me out. Well, yeah, he can if he wants to, but don't, don't be that kid. What, a, what a, a rottenness to his father's bones. What a displeasure to a parent's heart. A rebellious and stiff-necked child. Let's learn to cooperate with the Lord. And you know, another interesting thing I'll, I'll mention before I, I turn things over to David for the Lord's Supper. But you know, back to the, the doctrine of, of substitution and identification. You know, we've been given two ordinances, and that's all we have, really. <laughs> that's it. I know they, they've invented some others, you know, some sacraments and whatnot. But in Scripture, we have two ordinances: baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is an illustration of the doctrine of substitution. What did he say? This is my body, which is given for. This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Ba baptism is in regards to the doctrine of identification. <laughs> that I'm buried with him, you know, and I'm raised to walk in the likeness, you know, of him. You know, in the newness of life and also with him. And so it's an interesting thing that as we see that and we need the both of them in our life. Listen, I think I think we have the Lord's Supper down pretty well. We remember and we acknowledge that he died in our place to pay the penalty of our sin. But I think the thing that we struggle with in our lives is that illustration that was given by baptism. That there's a, a transformation, there's a loss of of self that you're buried and you're dead in the likeness of his death and that you're raised also in the likeness of his life god bless us to get that to learn that to understand it to appropriate it in our lives father god i thank you for your word and lord you know the slowness and the stubbornness of our hearts and, you know, perhaps I'm worse than all, and I would expect that, God. But I, I know my own. And, Lord, but you convict me that if, if we were really, you know, some super hot shots for you in this world, I believe that we would see uh, your power and your work and people coming to Christ and the moving of your spirit, Lord. And, and so, God, I look unto you for that that we want to take ministry beyond ourselves and we want to lead people to Christ and we want to make disciples and, 
And I believe that there's things that we have to learn and get worked out first. And I pray for that. And I pray for your working that out. Lord, I pray as a congregation of believers uh, for your ruling and reigning here, Father, for the leadership of your Holy Spirit. God, for your directing us as individuals and also as your body, the body of Christ. Father, for your giving gifts by your Spirit to each one accordingly. Father, for the edification of the church. I pray for that. And Lord, that you would lead us even today. The time is short. God, make us effective in Christ Jesus, your Son, to witness to the world around us. In your name we pray. Amen.